Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming this morning. We're happy to have with us Dr. Brian Zobeck, who will be discussing the cardiovascular outcomes with antibiotics with anti-diabetic agents. Dr. Zobeck is an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy at Rockford. He received his PharmD from the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy in Iowa City. He's a clinical pharmacist at KSB Outpatient Clinics in Dixon, and he has nothing to disclose. Mercy Health has reviewed the program for any conflict of interest or commercial support. No member of the planning committee for this education activity has any commercial re relationship to disclose. Welcome, Dr. Zobeck. Thank you very much. As said, uh, I'm Brian Zobeck, pharmacist and faculty member at the College of Pharmacy right down the road with a practice site uh, at KSB in Dixon, Illinois. So shout out to all the KSB people down there listening live this morning. So, uh, and then my practice sites there are in the Family Medicine Residency Clinic, uh, trying to deliver team-based care, and then the anticoagulation clinics primarily. So today, well, I have no disclosures. I wish I had some disclosures, that's why I play the lottery, but no disclosures, no financial interest, either past or present. Today we're gonna talk about the classes of diabetic medications that have recently been shown to reduce cardiovascular outcomes we're going to identify ideal candidates, and then we're going to try to apply that to a patient case at the end. So for a historical perspective, who's, who's uh, seen some of this dogma before? On the left, we have five clinical trials. In the farther right column, we have effects on microvascular complications. The next column highlighted in red, we have effects on macrovascular or cardiovascular outcomes. And on the far right, we have mortality. Who's seen that, or who's learned that uh, diabetes blood sugar control reduces microvascular but ma not macrovascular complications with a show of hands? Right? That's what we heard all the time. That's what we hear in school. And you can see that's pretty clear. In those five clinical trials, we have reduced retinopathy, nephropathy, small vessel disease, and yet none of them was shown to reduce major cardiovascular events. And on the right side, none of them was shown to decrease mortality, and actually one in the ACCORD trial, we looked at increased mortality potentially. And so we've been teaching our students and we've been practicing that lower blood glucose does not necessarily benefit macrovascular outcomes. And before we can start sweating and getting all clammy, I am not going to argue against that dogma yet. But there is some new information regarding at least medications that affect blood glucose that also affect cardiovascular outcomes. So more recently, we're talking about trials in mostly the last two years. Some of them go back to 2013, so four years ago. But this is the type of stuff that everybody's talking about on blogs and social media and listservs and around your water coolers and your grapevines. So I think it's important for us to be aware of what people are talking about. Uh, how many people have heard of, say, the EMPA-REG study or the LEADER trial? Show of hands, yes? Not many, this is gonna be really good then. So this wealth of data actually comes out of a little bit of sadness. So who has ever heard of Avandia or rosaglitazone? Show of hands. A few. What is rosaglitazone's claim to fame? Pulled from the market or at least got really strict prescribing instructions because it increased cardiovascular events. It was a great diabetes med and then it hit the market in post-marketing surveillance, it increased cardiovascular risk in our patients with diabetes who are already at cardiovascular risk. So it's essentially not used anymore. You have to go through so many steps to prescribe that med. That was probably the most famous of cardiovascular increased risk with anti-diabetic agents, but there were others. And that prompted the FDA to issue new criteria for pre- and post-marketing data on all agents approved for diabetes. So every single agent that's approved with diabetes has to have some cardiovascular income outcome trials. And we're going to do a little bit of orientation to hazard ratios. So we can see in this figure we have hazard ratio on the x-axis. And that vertical solid line of 1, this is when you're comparing uh, a new agent to placebo or active treatment. A hazard ratio of 1, that vertical solid line, indicates no 
significant benefit of the treatment or of placebo. So if our point estimates in the boxes and the 95% confidence intervals cross that line, we would say we can't tell if there's any difference. We can't tell which of these arms are better. The smaller the hazard ratio, so on this figure as we go to the left to 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, that would suggest that our treatment is superior as shown by the top line. You see that the point estimate and confidence interval does not cross that solid line of one indicating superiority of whatever we're testing. The second one down, you see that it crosses that line of one, so we would say there's no difference between those two arms. The third one down requires, is also no difference. The fourth one down is actually inferior. Whatever agent we're using has a higher risk. You can see that the hazard ratio, the point estimate is about 1.6 with a 95% confidence interval, so the line, spanning from like 1.2 to 2.0. We would say that whatever we were treating actually had increased risk of whatever we're looking at. So we're going to go over some of those select trials so that you can be informed what we're talking about around the water cooler, so to speak. We're not going to have time to review all of them, but I'm going to review some of the major ones. So we're going to start with GLP-1 agonists. And just a mechanistic reminder of what those do, looking over at our 2 o'clock at our stomach, they decrease gastric emptying, which also helps signal up to our brain decreased appetite so, uh, so that we eat less. Going around the right side, they increase insulin secretion and decrease glucagon secretion, which heads over to the left, it increases insulin sensitivity, net, decreases hepatic glucose production, and then increases uh, glucose utilization and storage in muscle and adipose. There's also mechanistically cardiac improvements by increasing cardiac function and cardiac protectivity, and maybe that has something to do with some of the outcomes we're going to see. So this is one of our big trials, leader trial. If anybody has to do a journal club presentation or gets the opportunity, this would be a great uh, journal club to do to evaluate a clinical trial. But leader looked at liraglutide compared to placebo. And we looked at it in almost 10,000 patients. And these patients had high cardiovascular risk. You had to be over 50 and have cardiovascular disease or else over 60 with at least one risk factor. And we followed those patients for almost four years. If you look at their background characteristics, their mean age was 64, they've had diabetes for almost 13 years, and their A1C was uh, eight, to, 8 to 9, most of them, with an average of 8.7. And this is important. as This is one of the major differentiators between some of the trials we're going to look at today, is that A1C at baseline. The, the prime range of the trials that showed effect seems to be between 8 and 9. A lot of the trials that didn't show effect were in A1Cs of 7 to 8, so are more controlled patients. So again, we're going to revisit this idea of is it the blood sugar control that's helping us out, or is it these actual medications that is uh, delivering our cardiovascular benefit? The primary endpoint on the fourth column over is a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. And we can see over on the right side that liraglutide reduced this primary endpoint by about 1.9%. Do we all remember our number needed to treat an absolute risk reduction, a relative risk reduction? So, yeah, so we'll run through it just in case we don't. So, uh, Lots of times when we see uh, drug advertisements, they'll say, we reduce the cardiovascular risk by 10, 20, 30, 50%. Well, that's a relative risk. So that's saying how many of the heart attacks. So in the placebo group, 15% of people had heart attacks. We're saying what percentage of those could we have reduced? And so you actually reduce it by 1.9%, but 1.9% of 15% is about 13%. So a, a drug advertisement would say, we reduce cardiovascular events by 13%. Well, actually, you only actually saved 1.9% of people. 
That's 1.9 out of 100. But that is actually very impressive in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction. When we talk about other things that we know give us cardiovascular risk reduction, like statins and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, we're hoping for, a, for maybe a 2% reduction. We want to take a patient whose baseline risk is 15% heart attack or 20% heart attack, and we want to get 18 or from 20 to 18 or from 15 to 13. That would be a good reduction. We're preventing quite a few heart attacks. And our number needed to treat on this is about 53. So a 2% reduction, we're saving two patients out of 100. That means the number needed to treat to save one of those cardiovascular outcomes is about 50 people. So we're gonna walk through that with essentially every trial because the number needed to treat, the patients we need to treat to prevent one heart attack or one cardiovascular death or one stroke is important. It's gonna vary in this presentation from 40 to over 400. So you'd have to treat 10 times as many patients with some medications, or at least based on some trials, than with other medications to prevent that cardiovascular death or that heart attack. Looking at secondary outcomes, they added unstable angina and hospitalization to heart failure and coronary revascularization, also a significant reduction, about 2.5%. So number needed to treat below 50, 42, when you throw in some unstable angina and some cardiac caths. Cardiovascular death was one of the main drivers. You can see a 1.3% reduction with a significant result, and then death from any cause. So in this trial, we showed you just give these people liraglutide versus placebo, and they die less often, about 1.5% less. And then the only one that was non-significant was hospitalization for heart failure itself as, an, as a lone outcome. So Leader got the press and is still getting the press. This is what people are writing commentaries and blogs and what people are going to talk about. But actually, there's four trials four separate ones on four separate lines of this graph that looked at GLP-1s for, for cardiovascular events. We have the ELIXA trial, which looked at 6,000 patients for two years in a very high-risk population. All of these patients had acute coronary syndrome within the past six months. Their median age was 60, a little bit shorter duration of diabetes at nine years, but here you go, A1C in the sevens, no difference. So this medication compared to placebo, no difference in major cardiovascular endpoints. For non-inferiority, non you know, it wasn't worse, right? It didn't cause more heart attacks than placebo, but it just didn't reduce them either. We already talked about leader on the second line, which was superior to placebo in reducing cardiovascular events. Semaglutide in sustain is a really impressive trial because look at how few patients they enrolled and for how little they enroll, followed them. I mean, they didn't use 10,000 patients or 15,000 patients like Excel down below. They enrolled 3,000 patients. So small trial, and they only followed them for two years. These aren't the highest risk patients either. You either had to have cardiovascular disease or you could have a risk factor. So this could be a 61-year-old male with hypertension. I mean, that's how low risk some of these patients were in trials like these. They had diabetes for 14 years. Again, this A1C range of eight to nine, it showed a big reduction, 2.3% in major cardiovascular outcomes, which was superior to placebo. So look, that trial is published, and that medication not available yet, but that is actually supposed to be the replacement to liraglutide, I believe, is how, how that drug company is going to advertise that one. So the next class, we're going to shift gears. We're going to look at the DPP-4s. And DPP-4s essentially work on the same system as the GLP-1s, right? We were just talking about medications where you give the patient this GLP-1, and we talked about the effects that has on increasing satiety and eating less and increasing glucose production, decreasing glucagon production. Well, the DPP-4 inhibitors just inhibit the breakdown of your endogenous GLP-1 in your body. So they work on the same system. The goal is to increase GLP-1 and give those effects that we're looking for. 
So this one, we're not actually going to look at one trial. We're just going to look at the summary slide because these trials are so similar. We have three of them, one using saxagliptin, allogliptin, and citagliptin down the left side. And at least two of these were large trials, but all of them are relatively short. The longest one at the bottom with citagliptin, 3.1 years. But some of these, you see the top one, the Saver Timmy enrolled 16,000 patients, and at the bottom we enrolled almost 15,000 patients. And they're high-risk patients, so pre-existing cardiovascular disease in the top and bottom, and then acute MI in the previous 15 to 90 days. I mean, these are people just coming off of heart attacks. There's the highest risk patients that we're looking to reduce cardiovascular events. Again, you can see A1C target about eight, about eight. And here, 7.2. None of these showed a significant reduction in cardiovascular endpoints. So as a class, no DPP-4 inhibitor has cardiovascular event reduction data, as opposed to GLP-1s, which two of them have been shown. Two out of four trials have shown reduction in cardiovascular events. Moving on to maybe the newest class of medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors. How many people prescribe these or know how they work? Relatively unfamiliar group. So these are new. These are being advertised on TV all over the place. So I'm sure you've heard about them. Uh, but these are how they work. So we're looking at a, a schematic of the kidney and your body naturally, you get rid of about 180 grams of glucose, gets filtered, and then your body reabsorbs it. Our bodies are efficient. They haven't adapted to our new lifestyle, right? Evolutionarily, they haven't adapted to uh, our rates of obesity. So our bodies want to save all the calories that we can. And it's very, our kidneys are very efficient at reabsorbing glucose that gets filtered through the kidney. And the main way that we do that is through SGLT2 in the proximal tubule and SGLT1 in the loop. And you can see that SGLT2 does 90% of the glucose reabsorption. And so we say to ourselves, man, if we could just pee out a lot of this glucose, it's on its way out. If we could just urinate that out, that would be a really helpful way to get rid of glucose instead of reabsorbing all that glucose back into our bodies. So they made drugs that targeted that. And of course they targeted SGLT2 because it's responsible for 90%. When we think about how much glucose this is, 180 grams, I mean 15 grams is what we tell our diabetic patients is a carb serving. So 180 grams of glucose is 12 servings of carbs, 12 servings. I mean, that's, that's two meals worth uh, in a lot of our, our diabetic patients. So if we can potentially get rid of a lot of that glucose out of the urine and not have it floating around in our serum, we can potentially be looking at a lot of blood glucose control. So these medications, like we said, they target your body's compensatory mechanisms. They inhibit your body's ability to reabsorb the glucose that you are, that you are so close to getting rid of. And this is a schematic of, of how they do that and what we're trying to do with SGLT2 inhibitors. So on the y-axis, we have urinary glucose excretion, how much glucose we are getting rid of in our urine. And on the x-axis, we have our venous blood glucose. So our blood glucose. As we can see, as our blood glucose goes up, we're able to reabsorb all of our glucose, right? None of it. As we go from a blood glucose 50, 100, 150, and even up to 200, we're not urinating any blood or any glucose. Our urinary glucose excretion is zero. We are able to reabsorb all of that glucose. Until you reach a threshold of about 200 or 250, people will argue back and forth what that threshold is, but until you reach a threshold, then you start urinating a lot of blood glucose. Excuse me, a lot of glucose exits in your urine. So we have glucosuria. The idea of the SGLT2s is to shift this line, this far right black line, to the left. And so with an SGLT2 inhibitor on board, we see that as we get a blood glucose of 50, 
going towards 75, we actually start seeing some urinary excretion of glucose. So when we get over to 150, we're excreting a significant amount of glucose in our urine instead of reabsorbing that into our serum. So we're just trying to shift this whole curve from the far right toward the left so that we can get some, rid of some of that blood glucose in our diabetic patients. And this is going to come, come back uh, important. We're going to show this slide again. So when these medications first came out, I really thought they were a Band-Aid. They weren't treating the underlying pathophysiology of diabetes, right? We learned in school, you should use metformin, and you should things that fight insulin resistance. Things like sulfonylureas, it was like the start of the end for them, right? You're just kicking the pancreas or squeezing the pancreas to get out more insulin. It's just a Band-Aid. You're just controlling blood sugar. It doesn't do anything to treat the underlying cause of diabetes or the pathophysiology. I thought these were the same way. We're just peeing out glucose, and that's it. It's just a Band-Aid. We're just going to pee out glucose, get some urinary tract infections and mycotic uh, genital infections, and, and it's, it's going to be a Band-Aid. Well, I'm here to tell you that I, it appears I'm wrong. The, <laughs> so, empagliflozin, or the Empereg trial, who's heard of this one? Not very many people. Well, this will be a good review then. So, uh, this, is, this is a huge trial in terms of diabetes risk. It was published in New England Journal in 2015. So, it's getting to the point where it's two years old now. There's, but there's been a lot of media posts. This is empagliflozin versus placebo in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, of course, looking for non-inferiority and then, greedily, superiority compared to placebo in, in reducing cardiovascular endpoints. They enrolled 7,000 patients, most of them with established cardiovascular disease. So these are high-risk patients, and they followed them for three years. The primary outcome, again, was cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and stroke. And we can see that there was a 1.5% reduction in that primary endpoint. Number needed to treat, about 62. Secondary endpoint added, hospitalization for unstable angina. Again, or this was the only one that was not superior. That p-value is very close to 0 0.05, but not. Going down... Cardiovascular death, reduced by over 2%. Death from any cause, reduced by 2.5%. Hospitalization for heart failure, reduced by a percent and a half. So a highly significant trial in only 7,000 patients for three years with large magnitudes of benefit. I mean, taking from if 12% of your patients are going to have a heart attack or a stroke or die from a cardiovascular cause, and we can reduce that to 10%, You've saved two out of 100 people. Again, we're talking, that's on the same order of the, the statin medications in secondary prevention for heart disease. And that's standard of care. <coughs> Excuse me. So if that wasn't enough for you to become a believer, just recently, so in June of 2017, the Canvas program was published in New England Journal. And this was a combination of two trials using canagliflozin, another SGLT2 inhibitor. So total number of patients with 10,000, but again, com combination of these two, and the mean duration is 3.6 years. And I want to point out something. Since they used two different trials, that each of these trials didn't follow the patient for the same amount of time. So they had to standardize the, the time, number of events per thousand patient years. So these events rates are not percentages, I went and converted this one to percentages for you, but all these event rates are not percentages on the right side, which is important to note. They're events for, per thousand patient years, so 100 patients followed for 10 years or any combination thereof. These patients, a little bit younger, 30 years at, with cardiovascular disease or 50 years with two or more risk factors. Their median age age was 63, diabetes for 13 or 14 years on average with an A1C in the low twos, you could see th uh, three significant reductions in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or stroke, albuminuria progression, and cardiovascular death and heart failure. But with this trial, the, the 
magnitude of the benefit was smaller than any other trial we've seen. I mean, the baseline rate of, cardiovascular, of this primary endpoint, cardiovascular bad things happening to us, was 10%, 10.1, and we reduced it to 9.8. How much of a reduction is that? I mean, you're talking about a third of 1%. In that Empereg study, we were talking about two whole percent, 2%, two, percent, two people out of 100, meaning we'd have to treat about 50 patients to prevent one cardiovascular death or an MI. Here, we're talking about a third of 1% meaning we'd have to treat over 300 patients to prevent a cardiovascular death or an MI or a stroke. So vastly different magnitude of benefit between these two medications and even compared to the GLP-1s that we talked about earlier. Canvas also raised some safety concerns for us. So here's some major safety outcomes in the Canvas program. It actually showed increase in amputation rate very small, very small increase. And again, this is per thousand patient years, six compared to three, but a doubling in the risk. But the numbers work out to about every 330 or so patients that we treat, we would see one extra amputation of a toe or the, the front of the foot. It also increased fractures by about the same rate for whatever reason. It's unclear why this is. But for about 300 patients, we would see one extra fracture with canagliflozin compared to placebo. We've known about the mycotic infections and that increased risk, both in males and then more drastic in females, and no change in diabetic ketoacidosis. One thing that lingered in my mind, I mean, we've seen that a lot of the trials that showed outcomes were in people with A1Cs of eight to nine. And we know, especially with the SGLT2s, that, that the higher your blood glucose, right, as you go farther to the right, the more glucose you are going to get rid of in your urine. So instead of enrolling people with A1Cs of 8 to 9 with blood glucoses in the 180s or 190s, you know, way over here on the right side of the graph, would the SGLT2 specifically have the same effect if we use them in a patient whose blood, whose A1C was closer to six, like in the 120s, so looking farther left on the graph? Because those people aren't going to get as much glucose removed from their serum in the form of their urine. And again, that's kind of getting to the question of, is the, is the cardiovascular effects, is that... Uh, mediated by blood glucose? Or is it just something about these classes of medications that's lowering patients' cardiovascular risk? So we look at, at this graph looking within the SGLT2, within Empereg, with empagliflozin. And on the y-axis, we have the A1C level. Over time, on the x-axis, going from about zero to four years. And the A1C reduction is not particularly impressive. At the beginning, we see most A1C reduction in the first three months, and we're talking about 0.6% on average. And as we go along in the trial, it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, closer back to that placebo line displayed in gray. And by the end of the four-year trial, and even in like the three-year range, when we looked at the cardiovascular outcomes, we're talking about a 0.4% change in A1C. This is not a huge difference. I mean, we're talking about half a point. That's a blood glucose of approximately 15 points difference. And even if, so if you go back to some of those, some trials, some retrospective trials that suggest that patients with lower blood glucose tend to have less cardiovascular events, Again, we showed our randomized control trials from 1995 to 2008 say that we can't show that lower blood glucose reduces cardiovascular risk. But some people have done large retrospective data analysis that suggests that people who achieve lower blood glucose or lower A1Cs have less cardiovascular risk. Even if you believe that retrospective data, 
this A1C reduction of less than half a point is not sufficient to cause a 2% reduction in cardiovascular events that we saw in Empereg. So in my opinion, it is unlikely that, that the cardiovascular risk reduction is due to blood sugar reduction alone. It's just simply too large of a cardiovascular risk reduction to be accounted for in only blood glucose. Because we look back at DPP-4 trials, they reduced blood glucose just fine, and yet didn't see that cardiovascular risk reduction. So enough of all that trial data. Hopefully you like trial data and number needed to treat an absolute risk reduction, but now we're actually gonna apply it to a case. And so being down from rural Dixon, Illinois, we threw some corn in there. We've got Daryl Miller, get it? DM, patient DM for di it's diabetes presentation. 66-year-old male. He's had diabetes for nine years. He's got hypertension, hyperlipidemia, kind of your general diabetic patient that's coming in to see you. He's 70 inches tall. He weighs 220 pounds. His BMI is 32. Blood pressure controlled at 122 over 78. His A1C is 8.5, so in that middle of that 8 to 9 range that we talked about. Glucoses are 140s to 170s, so he's not someone who's going 50 to 300 with his A1C. He's in a relatively tight and predictable range. His serum creatinine is within normal limits at 1.0 with a creatinine clearance of 82. <coughs> the medications he takes already is metformin, 1 gram twice a day. Glipizide 10 twice a day, lisinopril daily, atorvastatin at high intensity, and his daily aspirin. So I'd like you to pair with your neighbor. Feel free to shout out things to me, but pair with your neighbor and think about which anti-diabetic anti medication would work best to reduce Mr. Miller's cardiovascular risk. So think about which ones are even available which ones have been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk? Think about all your options. Lay your options out on the table. Well, one thing you haven't addressed, which would be important for me, you haven't done cost benefit or cost effective. And since this is one of the most highly advertised products, most of these, that means they're trying to push them, that means they're expensive. So, I mean, and I'm not quite sure did all these studies, what was the control in all these studies? Nothing? Metformin? I missed that. So we have a, a question from the audience addressing the cardiovascular outcomes, looking at what the control was, and also um, addressing cost-benefit analysis. I can't make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we'll, if you don't mind, we'll address that at the end once we're actually very close to the end and I think we're running ahead of schedule. We've got uh, 25 minutes left and I think only a few slides. So would anyone volunteer to share their answer of what they think would even be a good option or what their option would be to treat this patient with? So I think the three that we talked about, I mean, I, th I think it's obvious his A1C is above goal. Even if you'd have a loose goal for this patient, I think you'd say A 8.5 uh, is above his goal. And so, uh, and if you didn't think, you could always make it nine. So the three that we talked about today, and the three with the cardiovascular event reduction consideration would be the SGLT2s that we talked about last, the GLP1s we talked about first, and the DPP4s that we talked about second. So uh, remember the two classes that we talked about had cardiovascular event reduction were the GLP-1s. Two out of those four medications or two out of those four trials showed reduction. And the SGLT-2s, which two of those medications have shown cardiovascular event reduction. So I think either would be a good choice. I don't think there is a right answer here. I think your GLP-1 or your SGLT-2, I would tend to go with empagliflozin because I'm really impressed by by uh, the degree of benefit there, especially compared to canagliflozin and what's been studied so far. But we have to weigh individual patients' preferences, and we'll get to that on the last slide of the presentation. What else might you consider before starting medication therapy or whatever you wanted to start in this patient? 
Yep, so I heard diet from the back. Certainly, we always want to be counseling our patient on lifestyle modifications with diet and exercise. He's on metformin already. He's on glipizide already. You may want to approach the idea of an insulin. Remember, cardiovascular outcomes are only one part of a very complicated medical decision. You've got individual side effects and risks of each class of medication. You've got contraindications and drug interactions. You've got short-term goals and long-term goals, and all of those have to be weighed together. So I think to consider before starting medication therapy, you'd uh, consider his insurance coverage, the cost-benefit analysis, right? So if this patient, if you're going to prescribe something and this patient isn't going to be able to afford that medication or have to choose between uh, eating healthy and choosing healthy foods at the grocery store and buying this medication, that's certainly something you'd consider. Secondly, side effect profile. So with our GLP-1s, you're thinking about nausea and vomiting. With the SGLT-2s, you're thinking about mycotic urinary tract infections, correct? And so this, this person being male is automatically at decreased risk compared with females, but still at increased risk compared to placebo. Does he have anatomical abnormality or has he had urinary tract infections in the past? In terms of some of the, the concerns we raised in this presentation, increased amputation rates, increased fracture rates. Is this patient at really high risk of fractures or amputations? Other risks for amputations that were also shown in canagliflozin or the CANVAS trial were other risk factors. They were things like peripheral artery disease and neuropathy, the traditional risk factors we think of for risk of amputations. And then the SGLT2 was shown to increase that risk. And he's probably not at, large in at increased risk of fracture, but of course you'd ask about long-term steroid use, et cetera. And then expectations, I think, is really important to set in terms of cost, in terms of cardiovascular risk in terms of is the patient going to feel this medication working for them and then side effect profile the short-term side effect risks so we said this is a really you guys probably all use this in your practice but this is a really helpful chart that goes through on the top the different classes of medications and the considerations both efficacy and side effects and this is produced by the clinical endocrinologist they look at hypoglycemia, weight risk, renal and GU considerations, GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting or diarrhea with things like metformin, the cardiac uh, risk, so some medications show more risk, some medications actually are helpful in reducing cardiovascular risk, and that's really what our presentation focused on today, bone risk and fracture risk, and then ketoacidosis risk. So again, this is available from the clinical endocrinologists, non-branded. So it helps us make our decisions and explain benefits and risks to patients. So the take-home points is that the two classes of medications so far that have cardiovascular event reduction data are SGLT2s and GLP1s. And it's not just one trial. This is not one trial that showed a difference. Each of those classes have two trials that showed a difference. And they may be suggestive that it's not a class effect. That's going to be something to watch for going forward, is is this a class effect? Or is it something about the individual medications? And uh, cardiovascular event reduction appears, at least at this point, to be independent of glucose lowering potential. The magnitude of glucose lowering was small in trials where the magnitude of cardiovascular event reduction was large. So at this point, I'll take questions. This, this uh, is our Dixon Rural Training Track Residency graduation, so a joyous time. So I'd like to address the first question. So the first question was about cost-benefit analysis. And I don't have a cost-benefit analysis in this trial, but that's, that's a lot of what is talked about in blogs, literature, professional meetings, and publications is, is it worth the cost? And going backwards to presentations like Canvas. So 
we said that the number needed to treat, the number of patients we would need to treat to prevent one death, heart attack, or a stroke, not all of those things, just one of them, we would need to treat over 300 patients for an average of three years. If canagliflozin, and I'm just guessing, but if canagliflozin for easy math costs $500 a month, that's $6,000 a year. So over three and a half years, you're talking $20,000 at least in medication costs per patient. And then you have to treat 300 patients to prevent one MI. So what's, uh, what's $20,000 times $20,000 times 300, it's a lot of money. It's a lot. Yeah, $600,000, is that right? $6 million, it's a lot of money. Well, they wouldn't be advertising if it weren't a lot of money. Yep, so canagliflozin, probably not a great candidate. Now let's, let's look through, and that's because the degree of benefit, at least according to this trial, is small, right? A third of 1% of patients who take this medication for three and a half years receive that cardiovascular benefit. If we go back to empagliflozin and we look at uh, the primary endpoint, the same exact primary endpoint, the degree of benefit is at least, it's a percent and a half. So now you have to treat 60 patients, approximately 60 patients or 65 patients for three years with a medication that probably is similarly priced. But you can see you only have to treat a fifth of the number of patients. And now, so then instead of, uh, what do we say, 600,000? Instead of 600,000, you're talking about a fifth of that number. So now you're talking about $120,000 worth of medication treatments to prevent one cardiovascular event. And I don't think I'm in a position to say whether that's worth it or not. We as a society, we as policy makers, formulary makers on your P&T committee get to make that decision. But the cost benefit would be whether you think a cardiovascular death, a stroke or an MI is worth $120,000 or whatever our math works out. Yes, very good question. It depends on if it's my stroke or MI or your stroke or MI. I, yeah. I, I'm willing to pay for mine but not yours. Yes. Uh, Again, back to my first question, I, I'm lost in all these studies as to what the control was. Was this everybody on metformin? What, what, was the, what were the non... Yep, to, to address your question of what patients were taking besides this, so all of these trials were the medication versus placebo. Oh. But it, medication versus placebo in the setting of patients taking additional uh, medications. So they did not take patients off of their metformin or their sulfonylurea or their basal insulin. And so they basically just took patients with what they were taking already and randomized them to take a pill, just a, any pill. And the patients, of course, didn't know whether they were taking the active medication or the placebo. So I can certainly get back to you on the exact rates, if that matters. I don't remember all the rates of exactly how many people were taking metformin, but this is essentially, you take diabetic patients who are treated, but not always controlled, right? That's why we pointed out our A1Cs. These are in patients, most of these trials are in patients who are uncontrolled. Uh, and they- I'm pretty correct on this medication, it's $500 a month. Yeah. Thank you for that. So we had a comment that said that one of the medications we referenced was about $500 a month cash price with empagliflozin. Yep, empagliflozin. So these, the patients, the majority of them were on metformin. The majority of them were on more than one agent. So we added empagliflozin or liraglutide or whatever our study agent was versus placebo because we really want to control that being the independent variable. The only difference between these two groups we wanted to be the medication we're studying, going back to our scientific method. All else equal, and the way we do that is randomization, right? You just randomly select the patients who enroll to go on placebo or active treatment. And I assume that they were matched, so the 
Same number was on metformin, same number on insulin, everything? Yep, so the okay. question is regarding to matching an insulin. So they actually weren't matched. So matching would imply that we actually look at all the patients and we hand select them to get treatment with the active medication versus placebo. These were actually randomized. So most randomization you- That's not what I asked. In the randomization process, I assume there was no difference between the control and the treatment in the percentage of people who were on other medications. So the, and, and the same number were on metformin in the controls as in the treatment. The same were on insulin in the controls and in the treatment arm. So, the so they were. The clarification is in the randomization process or after the randomization process, did we get the same number of people on insulin and on metformin? And yes, in all of these trials, there's no statistical difference in the baseline characteristics in terms of any medication, number of medications, or any other baseline characteristics, including uh, age, gender, et cetera. But yes, very good question because if more patients were uh, treated with, say, a metformin, or if more patients in the placebo group were treated with a medication that could raise cardiovascular risk, then maybe that's responsible for the cardiovascular outcomes that we see in some of these trials. Yes, very good question, very good insight. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, so we said we, we pointed out that we're off by a factor of 10 with all of our big math in there. So yes, we're talking about a significant amount of money when we're looking at saving, treating uh, 60 patients for 3.1 years with a medication that costs $500 a month to save, to reduce our cardiovascular endpoints by say one and a half percent. Uh, talking about treating 60 patients uh, for that length of time is, is a significant cost. like for amputation. The lawyers certainly know about that because they're advertising on TV for clients who have had amputations on this medicine so they can sue the physicians and the drug company. So you have any idea numbered? Well, what would that be? Help me here. Yep, so the question is regarding... The difference, let's say three, just because it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. So the question is regarding number needed to harm for amputations. And again, remember this one is three, but it's for a thousand patient years. And so essentially for the rate, you divide each one of these by three. So this would be a two point, like a low 2%, and this one would be a low 1% because we're dealing with patient years and we followed these patients for three. So the absolute difference was about 0.3% of patients who experienced uh, uh, amputation, 0.3%. So when you do the number needed to harm calculation, you're talking about 330 people approximately that, that would get an amputation if they took canagliflozin versus empagliflozin. So I apologize that I didn't have the absolute rates, that we just had the thousand patient years up here. And conveniently, that rate actually is approximately the same as, or that absolute difference is approximately the same as the, the primary outcome. So we talked about a third of a percent reduction in the primary outcome with a number needed to treat of about 300 to 350. This rate tends to be about the same, the same absolute risk uh, reduction and the same number needed to harm. So we're causing about as many, approximately, as equal amputations as we are cardiovascular endpoint reduction, according in this one trial. Very, very good observation. Yeah, so like I said, the degree of benefit is relatively small, and there are some serious side effects that were raised here. So it's definitely something uh, to consider in our prescribing of these new medications that are being advertised all over. Yes, question in the middle of the room. Do you have any information as to the, uh, for the uh, harm with the EMPA trial? This is just for the CANVAS trial. Mm -hmm. So the question is regarding harm, and can you help me out? Are you looking at any specific outcomes? Just in general, because you have this chart that shows, mm -hmm. I guess, the safety outcomes of the CANVAS trial, but you, you didn't 
show that information to the end, mm -hmm. Yep. So we're talking about out safety outcomes in the ampagliflozin trial, and I apologize for, for time I took that out. The, the main side effect profile was what we already knew about. It was the genital mycotic infections, which we saw again in Canvas, and I don't think anyone was alarmed or shocked by those. It's something that we already knew from the pre-approval trials of these medications, and it's something that we've seen very regularly. And of course, we have a mechanistic reason explaining why that might happen. What was, they did not, in empagliflozin, there was no increased risk or uh, significant increased risk in amputation or fractures. So that's what was new, that, excuse me, that's what was new about the Canvas trial is that we found these side effects that were significantly increased, although a relatively small rate, uh, that we had previously not thought of before. And so now, any trial going forward, you would imagine would have to be designed to look specifically for amputations. And specifically, they are all, all designed to look for fractures, but they'd really zero in on fractures for this class of medications and amputations. Yeah, very good question, yeah. So like a gentleman said in the back, you're starting to see lawyer ads, right? When a trial like this comes out and it shows a significant increase risk in amputations, if you had an amputation and you were taking this medication, you know, there's gonna, there's call our lawyer's office. And, and of course we've illustrated here that it's a small risk increase, but at the same time in our efficacy, our efficacy, is, abs is relatively small as well. You're talking needing to treat hundreds of patients, like 300 for three and a half years on average to reduce the cardiovascular events, but also to cause an amputation. Question in the middle of the room.
they're more likely to stay down and put out insulin with the meals, their own. Uh, uh, and if they can't, uh, then you sometimes have to have a little insulin with the meal. But you've got to make it easy. Um, metformin once a day, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe lyric glutide or uh, in the morning, once a uh, morning or evening. If you're going to use insulin, use insulin overnight, use the GLP um, or the, uh, the uh, glucagon line except for in the morning. There are nice tools out there, but I think there's so many, uh, it's hard for the even the learning to use one. Mm -hmm. Very, very good observations from our audience regarding this patient and the considerations of when his glucose are high and when they tend to be lower, what his daily life looks like, what his diet looks like, his obesity, pointing out that this patient actually looks relatively lean compared to a lot of the, the patients that we see uh, and whether weight loss is an issue or, or whether that would benefit him from a, a hypoglycemic, or excuse me, a glycemic control standpoint. So th thank you very much for the insight. So I think that's worth repeating for all the distance is that the farmers are wonderful patients. I completely agree. You know, we're out there to serve our rural underserved communities, that's for sure. Yeah, so, so in this guy, I mean, you look at, again, looking at him, he's a little bit elevated in terms of blood glucose, but not particularly. He's probably in the overweight category. Uh, actually, his BMI says that he's in the low-end obese category, but not with a whole lot of central obesity like it's pointed out. So if we just skip forward, these are the things we're worried about. Is this patient experiencing low? Uh, weight doesn't seem to be a large issue, but the AACE recommendations really focus, and they recommend the classes that are weight neutral or weight loss. Um, you know, is he concerned about GI symptoms? Does he have them already? He's probably not at increased risk for bone problems being male as opposed to female, and if he doesn't have any major cardio or uh, major risk factors like long-term steroid use, et cetera. But this is maybe the picture, and especially if you throw an MI on this patient case, this is kind of the picture where cardiac becomes one of your big concerns in this patient. Blood glucose control, but then long-term cardiovascular event reduction. And an amputation. Yes. An amp half of his foot Yep, so amputation could be a big risk, and that's, we'll have to certainly look for that going forward, but the CANVAS trial suggests that maybe we're looking at an increased amputation uh, risk, and, you know, you throw coronary artery disease onto this patient, or say he's got some uh, neuropathy already, you know, is he at risk for an amputation, and how would that affect his livelihood? Because I'll bet he doesn't have a pension from farming the corn, you know? So how would he be able to function if he had a major setback like, a, like an amputation? Or does he have peripheral artery disease? And does that make a difference of whether you start an SGLT2 or not? Very good observations. I think we're at 8 o'clock. I welcome any more questions. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and excellent question and discussion points. Hopefully we've learned a little bit.